in the last two years, I have uh, stood at this Ambo and have not only read the gospel, but had uh, preached for a number of friends who have departed from uh, the Catholic community of St. Charles. And uh, this one is particularly difficult for me. I hope uh, all of these have been difficult, but I hope that you will keep in mind that if I begin to lose it, that you will uh, carry me over the, uh, to, to the goalpost, you might say. These words, how blessed, how happy with the virtues that are attached to it. Blessed are the poor, blessed are they who mourn, blessed are the meek. In reality, in the original text, a better translation would be happy. And it was associated with the island of Cyprus, an island that was called the Happy Isle, and the Greek word Markarios was associated with this isle for many, many, many centuries. It was an island so beautiful and so spectacular that you never had to go beyond it to find every perfection that you were looking for, for every happiness. It was an island in which the produce planted itself and grew by its own, by its own desire. It was a place of happiness and blessedness that was much like that of the, that was imputed to the so-called Greek gods. But the word happiness doesn't quite cut it. And the reason is because hap, the hap part of happiness, leads uh, us to assume that there's some chance associated with this. Something that happens to be something that happens. In these Beatitudes that we have heard read today, there is no chance. It is just the blessedness or the happiness of the kingdom of God. Please note that in the original text, there is no verb. So we don't have this present and future thing that we have in English. Blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they who mourn, for they will be comforted. Instead, we would have something that would sound something like this. How happy the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Happy they who mourn, for they will be comforted. It is a very, very well-known, what is called a Hebraism, uh, a use of the Hebrew language that has been imported into the Greek text here. It may seem a little, little bit nitpicking. You didn't come here today to have a Greek grammar lesson, <laughs> let alone a Hebrew lesson. <laughs> but there's something important in this about this man that we all loved so much. No, it's not because it's academic. <laughs> <laughs> It's not because there's a humongous number of footnotes, which incidentally I always, when we had arguments, I would always ask him, show me the footnotes. <laughs> and I hate to say he would say, that doesn't really matter, Bob. <laughs> Barclay, one of the people that Richard and I have stolen from the most over the years, said about this passage, these are not wistful glimpses of some distant beauty. They are not even golden promises of some distant glory. They are triumphal shouts of bliss for a permanent joy that nothing in the world can ever take away. We all know that Richard gave his life to this community over many, many years. There are many of you sitting here today who uh, have lost children, uh, either as young adults or as children, some by accident, some by their own hand. 
some by disease. This very, very good Jesuit father was with most of those families as they went through these extremely, extremely difficult times. He was their spiritual support. Now, I believe that while he would consider himself to be a radical, <laughs> you notice I did not say eradicated. <laughs> I said a radical. While he would consider himself to be that, the choice of this gospel, which uh, I'm pretty sure, I don't know where Brian is, but I'm pretty sure that this was, uh, where are you, Brian? Oh, <laughs> right there, that this was his choice. Okay, And it's partly because some of these virtues remained hidden in him. There's not a person here who doesn't remember his famous uh, story about when he was teaching uh, about, he said in his class, in my humble opinion, remember? <laughs> and one of the co-eds stands up and says, oh, Dr. McCafferty, in my humble opinion, you have no humble opinions. <laughs> His support of families, his support of anyone in need, still fills the grounds and the spirit of this place, and will continue to do so until the Lord that he loved often, almost sometimes as an anonymous Christian, <laughs> returns. Uh, he was a Ronner man, after all, and uh, I, it, it's interesting. I came upon him in, his, uh, in what became our common room after a while, once we had a big TV screen that we... He had the, I had the right-hand side of the screen, and he had the left-hand <laughs> side of the screen. And I came into his room uh, one afternoon, and I knocked... He was reading the Liturgy of the Hours. Yes, fathers, he actually was. <laughs> He hid the book so I wouldn't see it. <laughs> Father Richard and I have been through much together. In my initially uh, being sent here, um, I won't mention names, but I was told by the vicar general at the time, well, you're, you'll, you'll need to get rid of him. It never works out that having... Um, having the old pastor and the new pastor in the same place, it just doesn't work. So I met him, and of course I passed the acid test, at least for that time, with the, with the kitty, <laughs> who was the real administrator of this parish for many, many years. Um, passed that test, and then the next thing was, oh my goodness, am I supposed to put out this beloved man that everybody likes so much and everything else as my first official act. So I told him he could keep his office where it was for a year, and if that worked out, fine, he could leave it there. So at the end of a year, I said, oh, by the way, keep your office where it is. He, uh, he was a man of great heart, and uh, one, of the, one of his favorite uh, favorite. Gilbert, not Gilbert and Sullivan, Rogers and Hammerstein, was the king and I. For many reasons, he loved that particular show. But the song, Something Wonderful, kind of comes to mind. And the text of that song, this is a man who thinks with his heart. You Jesuits will have to forgive that for a moment, please. <laughs> his heart is not always wise. This is a man who stumbles and falls, but this is a man who tries. He will not always say what you would have him say, but now and then he'll do something wonderful. There are so many memories, and uh, for instance, like the time that I was up at the Shakespeare Festival in Ashland, and I told Richard, don't call me unless there's an emergency. And the phone goes off. And I'm like, oh, Lord, what is it? And he called me to tell me that, that he and I were cat grandpas. 
<laughs> we had found this little feral cat, literally including the tail, that long. Turned out she came pregnant. We didn't realize this. And uh, of course, uh, Tinkerbell was afraid of her. <laughs> Tinkerbell, she's not here. She was afraid of flies, too, actually. <laughs> but uh, yes, that was wonderful. We were cat grandpas. <laughs> or the time that we met Anna Connie, the beautiful gal that sings on Lawrence, well, used to sing on the Lawrence Welk show. And, uh, and he was so overcome with emotion. We both were. Uh, she was the, she's the kind of a person that when you're in her presence, you know that you're in the presence of a spiritual entity of some sort. And he says, what was it I said, Bob, the last time that we were there, uh, that we watched the Lawrence Welk show? What was it that I said? And I said, you said, every time I see Anna Connie, it's another proof of the existence of God. <laughs> And she said, that's the sweetest thing anybody said. She promptly gave him two hugs, gave me one hug. <laughs> Richard said that's all she could do to get my arms on. <laughs> and then on the CD we bought, which, which I have, it says, to Father Richard and Father Blank. <laughs> Oh yeah, he lived the Beatitudes. There are so many of these kind of stories, and I'm hoping that we'll have an opportunity to share some of those later today. But I want to share th three profound things and one funny thing. I sat right up there, I guess it was about eight years ago, when I first came to this parish, and Richard was preaching that weekend, and he stood here, Actually, it wasn't here because we had the old configuration. It was still the basketball court. Um, yeah, those of you who are really new don't know that history. It's, it's worth talking about. Anyway, he says, today I'm going to compare Jesus Christ to a skunk. <laughs> yeah, that was my reaction. <laughs> oh, my God, there's going to be a heresy trial. A, well, he had enough of those in his past, so we don't want to talk about that. But, um, and he went on to explain the story of Pepe Le Pew and how Pepe Le Pew is always in love and always rejected. And he spoke about the great unrequited love of our Savior who had poured out his life, who had given his blood for us, who had given every single thing that he had in order to bring us salvation, in order to be that we could be here today and stand in the loss of so great a friend and so great a man and be able with confidence to come before the throne of grace. Yes, that was my first, uh, my first um, introduction to some of his preaching. He told me, he said, you think that that's something now. You should have seen what it was when I was in Evanston. And uh, he preached there uh, the last time when he preached that it was St. Athanasius Church. Uh, he said, this is going to be my last homily here. And somebody uh, stood up and said, it ought to be your last homily anywhere. <laughs> And then the 90-year-old gal who had been the head of the altar society before said, why don't you go and start your own church? <laughs> so I was in Rome. I tried to buy a mitre for him, but he has something against mitered heads that are not, not easily. Since Bishop Cummins is not here, I'll, that's fine. <laughs> All except Bishop Cummins and uh, Bishop Garcia from uh, Monterey who uh, I think I taught uh, Father that there are some really good bishops in the world. <laughs> now, the other thing that's so profound that he said that may surprise some of you is he said, if we as priests at the altar ever allowed ourselves or were, or were it possible to understand what it is that we're actually doing there, our souls would leave our bodies, 
and we would be directly with God. In other words, the reality of the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist and what we call, I don't like this word, but confecting, they call it. Sounds like a, you know, a bakery or something. Uh, but, but bringing about this sacrament, um, that was what he thought about it. He hided a lot or hid a lot of these things from us. And he was a lot more tender than many people recognize. Was it Father Fred you used to call him? Yeah. What, and what did he call you? Samantha. Samantha, that's right. Okay. And Amanda called him Father Fred. <laughs> that's so good. I think the most profound thing, though, that Richard came up with, and it's something that I'm going to write a book about in about another two years. The title of it is uh, On Earth as it is in heaven, was his pointing out to us that the Lord's prayer doesn't go, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. If you look at the fathers of the church and you look at the grammatical structure, both in English, in Latin, and in Greek, you find there's no pause there. It should be thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in in heaven. Now, why is that so important? Why does that tie into the Beatitudes gospel? It does, because there isn't any verb in that gospel that relates today. It doesn't say, blessed are the poor, blessed are they who mourn. How happy the poor, how happy they who mourn. It's current, but it's fulfilled in the future, on earth, as it is in heaven. It is an extremely, extremely important point for our meditation. It's an extremely important point for how we make our lives work. We have some Franciscans here with us today, and this was very, very close to the heart of St. Francis. Having a new pope named Francis, who is a Jesuit, should focus us very clearly on this passage and should free up our minds and our hearts to never pray that prayer again with a pause there, as if somehow God's will wasn't going to be done. God's will will be done. Our prayer is not that. Our prayer that it's, is that it's going to be done the same way on this earth as it is in heaven. Those are the, the three serious points that I wanted to make. And now, just ending up here, I was very concerned that there was no box of Kleenex up here, um, and I thought that it might be a taunt uh, of somebody was reminding me of a strange sequence, uh, which I'm about to tell you. Uh, Father Richard and I went on many vacations together, and we went uh, every year to Pacific Groves. Stop smiling, Larry. It's okay. <laughs> uh, every year to, um, to Pacific Grove. And we, he taught me many things. He taught me to be a full-fledged curmudgeon. I mean, uh, th that was, and that's a valuable thing. You know, there's no graduate school that offers a course in curmudgeonry. You have to kind of pick it up, you know. And I had the master there. You saw his academic robes and his doctoral hood and all of that. Well, that's where he got it, was degree, uh, PhD in curmudgeonry. Uh, even when he was young, that's a joke. I didn't mean that. <laughs> but because we were curmudgeons, and because at that point he was still tolerating the San Jose Sharks, we used to go and we'd watch the Sharks games most of the night or most of the afternoon and evening. And then the next day, I would go down to the local grocery store and buy four or five newspapers. We'd come back, we'd spend half the day there in that spectacular beauty of Monterey Bay, doing what? Sitting indoors, reading newspapers, listening to uh, big band music and uh, Schubert, you know. That was what we did. Well, I went down there one morning and, uh, to the grocery store, and I saw this sale. You know those great big Kleenex boxes, like 250 pack of it? <laughs> That's no fair. You know the story. Uh, I saw this sign. It says, five for a dollar. <laughs> five, count them. 
five for a dollar. And I come back and I'm all euphoric and I say, Richard, listen, we found a great source of income here. <laughs> now, now look, the way I figure this, we could go and open a roadside stand to sell Kleenex. We could sell these, these for, for 75 cents a box and still make a huge profit. You know, and he was going, yeah, that's a great idea. I saw a turnout down there just before you go into the mountains. We could actually stop the, you know, and all of that. So we're getting ready to go home, and home we go. And, uh, and he uh, came and looked at the thing, and when I looked at it, what it said was, buy five, get a dollar back. <laughs> I can understand why he never quite trusted me on certain, <laughs> certain ways. Richard and I were incurable romantics. Whenever we'd watch a movie, we would have copious amounts of Kleenex, which is probably one of the reasons why I was so delighted to have thought I found that great buy. Always, however, respecting each other's sense of manliness, we'd pretend not to notice the tears and then shoved the Kleenex box closer. After this debacle of the Kleenex, uh, he was such a good man, he let me win a Mozart trivia contest on the way back in the car. And that was very good. The title of his favorite musical, The King and I, is now his whole occupation and his continuing life. It is his call and his home for Richard is living the subject of his doctoral dissertation. The medium is the message. Richard is with the king and all those who are called to the banquet of the Lamb. And may God richly bless you this day.